Welcome to our second event of the Oxford Economic Society for 2021. I'm Oscar, the co-president of our society. Today, we are proud to welcome Steve Keane, uh, who is a fellow at the Center for Policy Development and professor and head of school uh, of economics, head of the School of Economics, History and Politics at Kingston University in London, a hub for heterodox economic thought. He is a vocal critic of neoclassical economics, which he's argued is inconsistent, unscientific and empirically unsupported. An expert on the work of Hyman Minsky and simulating uh, financial instability, he received the Revere Award in 2010 for being the economist whose work is most likely to prevent a future financial crisis. Today, he will be discussing macroeconomics without micro using post Keynesian economic theory. The talk will last 45 minutes with 15 minutes of questions at the end. Make sure to send in your questions throughout the talk through our pigeonhole page. The link should be in the description of this event. If you would like to rewatch our events, they'll be posted on our YouTube channel afterwards. Thank you for joining us, Professor King. Thank you, Alex. Better bring myself up to date too. I left Kingston about two years ago, and okay. I'm now uh, an honorary professor at UCL, uh, though I'm based in Bangkok because this I made the decision uh, about nine months ago that it was a much safer place to be for COVID than the UK, which was even it's even more true now than it was then. Okay, so let's just uh, get ready to roll. So I'll just share my screen. And we can start the presentation. Okay. Well, economics has had an obsession with equilibrium, which I now want to say it's time we abandoned it, please, because this has kept us in the 19th century uh, while the planet has moved on to the 21st. And it's no wonder economics can't understand what's happening. And if you go back to the originators of neoclassical economics, you find that they regarded equilibrium as it should be as a shortcut. And they were wrong about some of the effects that they thought, but this is Jevons, who was a, one of the major founders. If we wish to have a complete solution uh, in all its natural complexity, and I love the fact that Jevons used that word long before it had the technical meaning it has today, we should treat it as a problem of dynamics, but it would surely be absurd to attempt the more difficult question when the more easy one is yet so imperfectly within our power. So that was, it was, it was done as, because they simply didn't have the tools for dynamic analysis back then. If you look at uh, J.B. Clark, who invented the marginal productivity theory of income distribution, which is one of the many mistakes of neoclassical economics, but again, they weren't to know that back in the end of the 19th century. He thought the 20th would be when dynamic economics happened. Uh, now, some neoclassicals might think they've done dynamics, garbage. I'm sorry, what they call dynamics is, is pathetic uh, from a point of view of, of somebody who knows their mathematics. And I'm quoting here, uh, a mathematician who was twice nominated for the Nobel Prize in Physics in the 1950s. And when he looked at economics, he said that uh, it, it, it's what, what passes for dynamics in the 1980s for economists uh, is so bad that capitalism might cease to exist before economists actually understand the, the, the dynamics of capitalism. And of course, I'm sure many would say, and this is a classic here from Shari, V.V. Shari defending neoclassical economics after the failure uh, of any neoclassical model to forewarn of the financial crisis back in 2007, saying we've got to use a DSGE where, of course, the first letter stands for dynamic. But I love the fact that Roma came out not long after Paul Roma and said that for more than three decades, which takes me right back to my quote from Blatt, macro has gone backwards. In fact, it's done so badly, you can't even call it postmodern. He said it's better to call it post real. So I think my Black's comments in 1983 stand as a description of the so-called dynamics of economics today. And one of the best arguments I've seen about why economists have stuck with equilibrium when genuine sciences and proper disciplines have long ago abandoned that is simply a crutch. It's because of failure, a creative failure. Uh, there's so many times that neoclassicals wanted equilibrium to apply and the mathematics showed that it didn't. And each time they, that they failed that, they also failed to accept the failure and continued coming up with new uh, ways to get back to equilibrium, which turned it from a crutch into a belief. And uh, for example, the very first element of this was Volra's determinant process as a way of working out a price vector, starting with a random set of prices, could groping is what determinant means, uh, actually lead uh, by a process of increasing the price where there's too much demand and dropping it, where there's too much supply and see what would happen over time. Would it converge to equilibrium? Well, it took about 20 or 30 years for mathematicians to prove otherwise, simply by accident. Uh, 
uh, that, that wasn't the case. That particular routine would not converge because of the eigenvalues of the matrix that describe the process. And how did they react? This is Jorgensen in the 1960s saying, by suitable restrictions on the initial values of the disequilibrium variables, the non-negativity of all economic variables can be preserved. That's nonsense. That's saying if we start in equilibrium, we don't have to leave it. I'm sorry, you're supposed to start anywhere, which is the way that uh, Volras looked at it. These days, economics is dominated not by Volras multi-commodity general equilibrium, but by Ramsey's intertemporal equilibrium. And that's the basis of both real business cycle models and DSG models. Is that stable? No, it's not. It has a saddle point, which is by definition unstable. If you imagine trying to throw a ball bearing onto a horse's saddle, I think you get the idea of the sort of instability I'm talking about. So the solution was to assume that we have these omniscient agents who can locate the stable fork, effectively the line going along the spine of the horse and jump onto that instantly. Uh, in which case, why do you need a market? If we're omniscient, why don't we just do instantly go to the right place? So the, these nonsense failures, nonsense reactions to genuine mathematical failures led to them getting obsessed with what they call simplifying assumptions to fudge being in equilibrium. And I think this is probably when, when people look back and see why did economics do such a bad job, this particular one is likely to be the, the ultimate reason because of the defense Friedman put forward about uh, using crazy assumptions to get over logical problems in economics was to call them simplifying assumptions. Now, if you look at what a simplifying assumption actually is, Galileo, for example, when he proved that heavy bodies fall at the same rate as light, light bodies when they're, when they're quite dense, uh, effectively you might say he assumed there's no air resistance, which of course is unrealistic. But if you'd taken the air away from the device that he used to demonstrate this, which wasn't the Leaning Tower of Pisa, it happens it was a, a sloped piece of wood. But if you'd evacuate the air, it would have made very little difference. It's trivial. So a simplifying assumption is something that makes your analysis much easier, but makes very little difference to the actual result. Whereas neoclassicals apply this, this dictum that Friedman invented to what a wonderful philosopher of science, Alan Musgrave, called domain assumptions, where if the assumption is wrong, then so is the theory. So it's extremely important that the assumption be true, but it's applied all the time to assumptions which are manifestly false. Now, combine that with this fetish to base macroeconomics on micro, and you can understand where we've gone so badly wrong in the last 40 years. So this is Lucas in the year he became the president of the American Economic Association saying you have to use general equilibrium for macroeconomics. And he thought that somehow the theory had to be microeconomically founded. And that was the task of his generation, Lucas's generation. So they thought they were doing a good thing, which is fair enough, okay. But when you look at what actually happened, again, when good mathematics is applied to neoclassical economics, what's known as the Sonnenschein and Mantel algebra theorem, which you can find buried somewhere in, um, in neoclassical textbooks and, and badly described every time. But the result of that, when you generalize the situation from which you derive an individual demand curve to where you have a market demand curve, where therefore changing prices must change the distribution of income. The result is that any continuous real function you can here to define could be a demand curve. In other words, it doesn't have to slope down doesn't have a negative, negative slope. Now, my favorite source of obfuscation and mendacity in economics in its textbooks are the textbooks written by Samuelson and Nordhaus. And here is their discussion of how you derive a market demand curve. The market demand curve is found by adding together the quantities demanded by all individuals at each price. And then he says, does the market demand curve obey the law of downward sloping demand? It certainly does. Well, how did Samuelson prove that? This is still one of the most remarkable pieces of nonsense I've read in a discipline full of it. Because again, I'm going back to this quote, every continuous real valued function is approximately an excess demand function. That's the genuine mathematician's result. Samuelson proved otherwise by this, the same argument will apply to all of society if optimal reallocations of income can be assumed to keep the ethical worth of each person's marginal dollar equal. 
In other words, capitalism gives you a downward sloping market demand curve. If we assume there's a benevolent version of Stalin there, who redistributes all incomes before trade happens. So everybody is happy with the distribution of income. Sheer nonsense, but that's the sort of thing that passes for simplifying assumptions in neoclassical economics. Now, the other problem about trying to drive macro from micro is that it simply isn't possible to derive a higher level analysis from a lower one. And physicists realized this back in the 1960s. This is a genuine physics PhD, uh, Nobel Prize winner, Philip Anderson, saying you can actually make up a table like this, saying that um, chemistry depends upon many body physics and molecular biology depends upon chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. So once you've done it, um, the fact that you can do reductionism doesn't apply the, apply the reverse, which you call constructionist, where you start from many body physics and derive chemistry, or you start from molecular biology and derive cell biology. And they said that simply isn't possible. At each new level, you have to use new techniques of analysis, which are as unique in their own right as the ones below. And the wonderful punchline, psychology is not applied biology, nor is biology applied chemistry. And I extend that to see neither is macro applied micro. Now, the whole process of trying to achieve micro foundations is futile. For a start, the foundations are fictions. The whole idea that rising marginal cost rises because of diminishing marginal productivity is empirically false. Firms don't suffer from it because factories are designed by engineers, not economists. So they don't even encounter the problems that are built into the economic theory. So when you look at the, uh, the surveys, of about, there have been about 20 or 30 surveys, they've all find that marginal cost is constant or falling for the vast majority of firms. You also can't get a complete set of preferences. The whole idea that you can derive somebody's demand curve uh, from their preferences is nonsense. So you can't, and then, and then on top of that, even though it, 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 the foundations are rotten to begin with, even with good foundations, you couldn't do it. But does that mean no foundations? And this is the sort of worry that you can see amongst neoclassicals today, but there'll be a Blanchard uh, making a quite a, a genuine point. Uh, you know, do the do DSU models have a future? And he said, well, we have to start from micro foundations. Where else can you start from? And he said, if you do that, you've got to do a huge long slog to go from the model of a competitive economy to a reasonably plausible description, uh, but it's hell, hard to see where else to start from. Well, this is the blinkers that get imposed upon you by becoming an expert in a particular paradigm, which is false, because you can start from macro itself. And I want to show how to go about that. So if I start from, uh, and I'm going to end up deriving a model which was first built by Richard Goodwin back in 1967, but I'll start by defining omega as the wages share of GDP, total wages divided by total GDP. Now, when you put that in terms of rates of change, so the hat means one over omega, the omega dt, the percentage rate of change of the wages share is gonna be the percentage change of wages minus the percentage change of GDP. Very simple mathematical rule. If I define the employment rate, the same story. Employment rate is the ratio of, of the number of workers, uh, employed workers L to the total population N. Um, the rate of change of wa employment rate is therefore the rate of change of employment minus the rate of change of population. Uh, if you then bring in a couple of assumptions, and these are genuine simplifying assumptions, I'm assuming a standard uniform wage. So I can divide the wage and the wa rate of change of wages into the rate of change of the wage uh, itself plus the rate of change of labor. Uh, have a linear Phillips curve, which again is another simplifying assumption. And have a de again, bring in a few more definitions, the output to labor ratio, which I use A for, and assume that that grows at a constant rate alpha. Uh, a capital output ratio, which I assume is fixed. Assume that all profits are invested uh, and do the substitutions necessary. And I then get a simple two dimensional model with the rate of change of the employment rate and the rate of change of wages share. Now, when I simulate that, I get cyclical growth, which is a bit uh, more interesting than the obsession the classicals get but of course, with equilibrium. But of course, you don't see cycles that are that regular in real capitalism. So I can extend it by saying, well, let's bring in one more necessary de de definition for a capitalist economy. And that's the ratio of private debt to GDP. And I'll explain why I justify that uh, after I present the results in terms of a model. So now do the same story to the differentiation of D, 
which is going to show the rate of change of the debt ratio is the rate of change of debt minus the rate of change of GDP. But you can actually put these um, definitions into an interesting sounding dynamic uh, verbal statement. So the employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of change in the output to labor ratio, which is A hat, and population growth, which is N hat. And because I'm not sub doing any substitutions, that is still the definition. A similar one for wages, the wages share will rise if total wage bills grows faster than GDP, and the debt ratio will rise if private debt grows faster than the economy. Now, having done that, I'm gonna say, let's just assume now that debt is used to finance investment when investment exceeds profits. And of all people, Thammer and French, two people who propounded the ludicrous capital assets pricing model, when they did empirical work, they were very, very good. And they found, yes, it's true that the main function of change in debt is to finance the gap between investment and profits. So I bring that in, I have investment, I show investment being driven by the rate of profit. And what I get out of that, again, a very simple model uh, where I explain all the terms here. So GR is the growth rate, IG is the investment to GDP ratio, uh, pi R is the profit rate, which is pi S, the profit share divided by the uh, capital output ratio. And there's all my definitions there. And I put it together and modeled that in my software package Minsky. And I'll just bring this up now. I hope I've, I've just actually installed a new version. So I hope, uh, yes, okay, it's going to ask me which one I actually want to use to run it. So this is the model. And these equations here are all done defined using a flow chart, but Minsky shows them in equation format over here as well. So that's the model I've just explained to you uh, very quickly a moment ago. Now I'm just going to change the slope of the uh, profit function there so it's not quite as steep. And what I'll get out of this is a model which slowly converges to equilibrium. I'll let it run for a short while, but I know that's going to settle down to equilibrium. But if on the other hand, I have a more aggressive desire to invest by capitalists, I simulate this model and it's going to run rather slowly in this machine. Ah, here we go, happening straight away. You can see what's happening, I think. It looks like it's heading towards equilibrium but there's a rising level of debt to GDP and you appear to converge for a while. So you have what economists might call a great moderation. But then after a while, the cycles get to be more extreme and ultimately this model will break down. Now, that is what happened from the 1980s to the 2010s. We had a period of apparently diminishing cycles in the growth rate, uh, which neoclassicals heralded as the great moderation and then a crisis, which they couldn't see coming driven by a rising level of debt that they don't think is important. So you can go further than I've shown you there. This is a more general model with nonlinear behavioral uh, elements to it and price dynamics as well. So this is a foundation for building a genuine dynamic model of the economy. And it, rather than take being a hard slog, these model, this particular model took me about a day to build, uh, just working from first principles. So I, I won't run simulator. I'll talk about it later if somebody wants to see that model, but it's quite straightforward. The part I'm sure some people are saying, oh, why does private debt matter? Well, this is another issue where the neoclassicals have been wrong for a long time. And that is they don't think money matters. Uh, and therefore they don't think banks matter and they don't think credit matters. And that's where they're fundamentally wrong. So I'm gonna show this, the importance of credit within three steps. First of all, showing you an economy uh, where there's no money, oh, there's money, but there's no borrowing uh, either by individuals from individuals or individuals from banks. And if you look at that and, and use what I call a more table for laying this out, horizontally, I have expenditure by a particular sector and the sectors it spends it on. So the sum of every row has to be zero. That's expenditure. This is income. The same for the other two sectors here. So the negative of the diagonal is aggregate expenditure. The sum of the, sum of the negatives the sum of the off diagonal is aggregate income. They're necessarily equal. That's, and that's the basic logical starting point. Now let's bring in money. Uh, we're using the mythical model that neoclassicals prefer of loanable funds where banks don't originate uh, debt. Uh, it's, it, the banks intermediate between a saver and a lender, a saver and a borrower. So what I then show is that there's, imagine the, the household sector is borrowing off the services sector. So there's a flow of credit dollars per year 
to the households who then use that to buy from the manufacturing sector. And when I do the sums on this, the same stories I've done for the one with no borrowing at all, what I find is that interest payments set up as part of aggregate expenditure, expenditure and aggregate income, but credit cancels out because for every positive entry for credit there's a, that's positive there, there's a negative. The same thing applies when I look on the off diagonal. For every positive, there's a negative. So credit doesn't play a role in the, in the, in the world if banks are simply intermediaries, which you will still see your textbooks claiming they are. Now let's look at the real world where banks originate money and debt. I'm using that term bond as an alternative to what post Keynesians have called endogenous money for a long time. So a bank, a bank lends credit dollars per year to households. The households then spend credit dollars per year on manufacturing. And so I've now got to show the assets of the banking sector as well as the equity of the banking sector. So the model becomes more complicated, but there's an increase in debt, which is credit, causing the assets of the banking sector to rise, an increase in liabilities, which is credit, causing the liabilities to rise, and the credit is then spent on the manufacturing sector, and the bank then receives interest. When you do your sums there, credit turns up as part of aggregate demand. There's only one entry on the, li on the liability and equity side for credit. Uh, on the expenditure side, there's only one entry for income. So credit is part of aggregate demand and aggregate income and leaving it out means you're not actually modeling capitalism. So, uh, and, but they continue to be proud of not including banks and debt and money in their models. This is Tony Yates, a guy that I occasionally just with on Twitter. Um, we got to like Tony over, the, over time. We had a bit of a fight when we first interacted, but here he is rubbishing anybody who uses money saying, in terms of mathematical modeling, you're better to do, uh, leave money out completely, do banks without money. Um, and we've confu confused ourselves by starting with little pieces of paper whizzing around. And at the more significant end of neoclassical economics, Paul Krugman, the same idea, trashing the importance of the Bank of England paper, showing that banks actually originate money and debt and saying it doesn't make any difference. Well, yeah, okay, I can find plenty of evidence to confirm their case. Here's proof that money doesn't matter, except that it isn't proof, it's a proof of the opposite because the correlation coefficient between credit and unemployment and the USA, which should be no different from zero, according to neoclassical economics, is minus 0.81. That's even including the recent spike uh, in unemployment and credit caused by the uh, COVID crisis. It's even higher when I restrict it to before that particular crisis hit. Um, if we ignore money and credit, then you don't worry about the data series I'm showing you here. The red line is the level of private debt in America compared to GDP. The blue line is the annual change in that debt, which is credit. The rate of change of debt is credit. And when you take a look at it, the three major crises that America has had are the Great Recession where credit turned negative, the Great Depression where credit turned negative, and the long forgotten panic of 1837 when credit turned negative. So there's warnings in the empirical data to confirm the relevance of the post Keynesian focus upon credit and debt and the irrelevance of the neoclassical belief that it doesn't matter. We're not looking at a major signal that actually tells us how capitalism is behaving. Again, there's been a qualitative change in the nature of the economy. If you go back to the pre great uh, second world war period, there were 13 negative credit events between 1837 and 1940, uh, 1939. But in the post-war period, there's only been one. So there's been a significant change in the nature of the economy in the post-war period. Again, something you wouldn't even know if you don't focus on the importance of, of banks, debt and money and credit in analyzing capitalism. So again, history did give clues. You've got to be blind to history, not to see this was coming. And then loanable funds and, and, uh, and money. Well, I've, I've shown logically uh, why that's different. If I bring up a model of loanable funds here, again, done in my software package, Minsky, I'm happy to give a course at some stage if you'd like to, to see how that runs. I can run my Minsky model here and have an increase in the rate of lending and a slowdown in the rate of repayment and I get, I get a huge change in the debt level, um, but not much change in overall GDP. A bit of a change, clearly, 
but uh, nothing, nothing particularly dramatic. And then a fall in the debt levels, it changes who's got the money. It doesn't make an enormous difference to the, to the GDP of the economy. Now, with a few relatively simple changes to that file, all I have to go and show is that it's not the banks doing, uh, not the, uh, the non-banks doing lending, it's the bank. If I go now and simulate this particular model, which is now including the role of, of credit in aggregate demand, then if I increase the rate of lending, I get a boom in the economy. If I slow down repayment, even more so. If you have a repayment more rapidly, lending more slowly, you have a slump. That's exactly the same model. The only change I've made is to say that the, bank, the loans are a, an asset of the banking sector rather than an asset of a non-bank. So we're in a very different world. Uh, it is sig it's highly significant to include the role of bank debt and money, just as significant to go from an equilibrium fetish to a real world one. So it's also possible to take a look at MMT now and what I'm doing in this model uh, is including the fact that the government by spending creates a deficit. Uh, when you think and begin people wrongly think the government has to finance a deficit by borrowing from the private sector. The private sector in that sense is this side, the liabilities and equity side of the banking sector. Uh, they don't borrow from you and me at all or for the banks and the equity. What happens is when the deficit is run, it increases the money in the bank accounts of the private sector and the non-bank non sector. It also increases the reserves of the banking sector. And then when the banks are offered the, the deal of using this extra money they have on their asset side from the deficit to buy bonds, it's a positive exchange for them. They get rid of an asset that has no rate of interest to get one that does. So of course, they're going to buy those bonds and then they get interest payments made to them as well, which is part of how money is created. So this, this is the sort of modeling that I wanna get economics onto. And it's extremely simple to drive a Minsky model. Um, Minsky, you don't even see any differential equations here, but Minsky generates those for you. All you have to do is define the flows and you've got your definition of a model. So that's what I've done here. And again, showing that uh, if, you, if you run a deficit, rather than a deficit burdening future generations, a deficit enriches the current generation because the deficit creates additional money, creates positive equity for the, uh, for the uh, non-government uh, non sector and enables it to spend and have e a commerce without having to borrow money to do it. So again, the, the fetish for equilibrium thinking the failure to model the banking sector properly, the failure to understand how banks actually works means that we have economic theory, which is biased towards austerity and which ends up causing catastrophes like the response we've had to COVID where part of the failure there was because courtesy of the arguments of neoclassical economics, we've run down the capacity of the, of the public sector and therefore we weren't at all able to be prepared for a pandemic, <coughs> pardon me. So you get all this nonsense about MMT being nothing new and quite wrong, the usual, the put down that Keynes expected he would get, indeed he did get uh, from his own colleagues when he came forward with his uh, approach to economics in the 1930s. And again, I'm just showing what, what's possible with Minsky. This was, uh, pardon the, the lab being a bit messy here, it's, it's a program we're continually redesigning and we've actually ch changed the width of some of these uh, columns just recently. So those ones are overwriting uh, each other. So you can't quite see it clearly, but I can, and I'll just see, I'll just waste a bit of time here. Okay, move this over. So I want to display the contents there. I just simply have to stretch these out a bit and then rearrange. So you spend a lot of your time doing graphics uh, when you're working in a, in a modern software package. I'll just Fix that up quickly here. This is a pretty bad demo. If I had a normal lecture, I'd be going a lot more slowly and showing things more uh, more easily. I know I'm going very fast and all I can see is myself. So I don't know who's actually watching here at the moment, but this is a model of, of mod modern monetary theory, including credit creation as well. And I can show, and I'm happy to go back and show this during questions uh, later that happens. 
that uh, the government running a surplus takes money out of the private sector and helps contribute to a financial crisis and running down the level of GDP. The exact opposite of what you'd want to do in a real world. So MMT is something new and it's correct. I've got problems with it when it comes to international trade theory, that's another story, but it's a description of how a market economy with a government sector that creates money by running a deficit and a banking sector that creates money and debt by extending credit, Minsky is capable of modeling that quite easily. Now, normally I bash neoclassical economics. Here I'm gonna be bashing everybody because when you look at what we've done, and this is going beyond the monetary and going to say, let, let's, we now have to integrate ourselves with ecology. Uh, all the production theory we've taught that includes the Lantier model violates the laws of thermodynamics. And this is one of those things which if you don't know it, it's about time you learnt it. Go and take a look uh, at some works on, on thermodynamics, on physics in general. And you'll find that th this is a beautiful explanation of why the laws matter um, by the uh, not, uh, 1920s, 1930s version of Stephen Hawking is uh, explaining if you don't understand entropy and you have a model which violates the second law of thermodynamics, then there's nothing for you for to collapse in deepest humiliation. And that really is the state of neoclassical economics because, and, and, and post-Keynesian as well, because we've ignored the need for energy to produce output. And about four years ago, this little insight occurred to me in a colleague's house full of statues uh, that labor with that energy is a corpse and capital of that energy is a sculpture. So we can bring energy in by treating energy as an input to labor and capital that enable them to do useful work. And then what you get is something which is realistic. So I'll start from the Cobb Douglas production function that I know you'd be having shoved down your throats at, uh, at, Cambridge, at uh, Oxford. And you'll also I imagine the CES, another complicated version of the same. This is the Leontief expression. So in, in both cases, there's no role for energy shown in either of those equations. But if I say, well, let's post K and L with K with E for energy is an important L with energy as well. And expand the end that out to say, it's the number of workers times the energy consumption per worker per year times the efficiency with which that's turned into useful work and a similar expression for capital, go through and do a bit of rearranging. And for the Cobb Douglas, this is the expression I get. And for the Leontief, I get this one. And that is what neoclassicals currently call total factor productivity. But from this logical derivation, it's actually the energy consumption level of the representative machine. So it's actually an insight into the nature of what we've been misunderstanding for all this time. Now, if you look at uh, bringing that model in, if I stick with the standard way that the exponents are chosen for the Cobb Douglas production function, uh, where alpha is given, uh, as it happens in this case, energy has the same exponent as capital. And since that exponent is normally 0.3, that would tell you that a 10% change in energy will cause just a 3.5% change in GDP. Whereas if you look at the empirical data, it's 10% for 10%, pretty much one for one. Now, the reason for this, uh, the reason we use that coefficient is because the Cobb-Douglas production function done this way fits national data really, really well. But I've got to actually now do something I very rarely do, and that's give a large compliment to a neoclassical economist, in particular, Gregory Mankiw. Okay? This is an excellent paper by Mankiw back in 1995, where he said, yes, okay, this Cobb-Douglas production function fits national data. But if you try to do comparative work using it, it gives you total nonsense. So the model itself can explain differences in incomes, per capita incomes, of slightly more than a factor of two. But you look between countries, it varies by a factor of more than 10. Uh, poor countries should have a rate of return to capital, which is 100 times as high as underdeveloped developed countries, meaning they should have a rate of profit of 1,000% per year, which is obviously nonsense. Uh, and the return, this, it, it, so the Cobb-Douglas production function, while it works very well with national data, is a disaster with comparative data. And he finally concluded that alpha should actually be 0.8. Now, if you do that, even with 0.8, uh, 
when you look at the correlation between change in energy and change in GDP, it's still understating how large the, the change is. So the overall outcome of all this is the Leontief equation is much more realistic because it gives a linear relationship between energy in and GDP out. And this is showing, uh, this is data for energy at the global level and million tons of oil equivalent on the horizontal axis and GDP in US 2010 billions on the vertical. And a simple linear relationship between energy and GDP fits the data like a glove up to just starting to break away now as we're starting to see some, uh, some, some uh, impact of you know, internet systems and so on. And, uh, but it's, it's the, the, the Leontiev is much more realistic and it, it, it can be modified more effectively to include the role of energy. So what we have to do now is say, how did energy work into economic theory? And I'm gonna do this very quickly. Again, I know I'm going very, very fast uh, given the time constraints of a 45 minute lecture here. But the way the, that I did this with Matthias Griselli, a mathematician in, uh, in Canada and Tim Garrett, a, a meteorologist uh, in um, Utah is I defined energy based output in Q and then map that back to output in terms of widgets uh, using an energy conversion EY. And just doing a bit of quick mathematics, it's again, I'm going too quickly here. What I found is that the, uh, the conversion factor comes back to that energy consumption of a representative machine. And what we call the capital output ratio is actually the efficiency with which energy is turned into useful work. And that has actually been rising over the last 30 or 40 years. And using that logic, uh, I showed you the, the Goodwin model at the beginning of the system where I was using the Leontier production function and not including energy. Uh, in fact, it's easy to get to the stage where I now have energy. So E subscript K, which is the efficiency with which energy is turned into useful work, replaces one out of V. Otherwise it's the same equation. And I get the same dynamics coming out of it as well. And when I put that together, and again, in the Minsky model, I can now include a few other possibilities. So for a start, I have waste occurring. Waste necessarily occurs because there's some energy which is not converted into useful work. Uh, and, and that turns up as part of your uh, dynamics. I'm also showing the idea of a resource constraint. Even Nordhaus has something like this in his model. He's got, I think it's 6,000 gigatons of, of carbon as the limits of fossil fuel. So I start showing if you, started with no, with no, um, um, no a tiny rate of depletion, then all of a sudden in the last 60 or so years, you start to run your resources down. I'm not saying that I expect a resource crisis to end capitalism, but this is showing that's, that's the feasible outcome unless we move to solar technology. So uh, you, you can make a range of, you, you can get an integrated economics and ecology out of this sort of thinking which you could never do with neoclassical equilibrium thinking. Now, one further step we had to do, and this is very, very preliminary, I haven't published this yet, uh, is that it's, it's an improvement to say you need energy to produce output over the neoclassical or Leontief unmodified model. But in reality, most of what we use that energy for is to transform matter from a form where it isn't useful, say for example, iron ore, into a form where it is useful, for example, iron. So we again, working with Matthias and Tim, uh, we then worked out how to explicitly model um, the, both matter and energy being used in production. So we get to the stage where we're physically, we have a biophysical economics as the foundation of our work. And when I look back at it, I, I knew from my research when I was a master's student that John Hicks had attempted to build a model of a production economy involving matter way, way back in 1935 in a paper called Wages and Interest, the Dynamic Problem. And he assumed that there was a single commodity called bread, which was produced uh, using labor and capital goods, which he called equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in fact, he gave, effectively gave up and treated equipment as being old bread, dated bread. Um, and this was actually what led to ISLM, by the way, because the ISLM model was actually based on this, as Hicks admitted in 1981. Uh, and I think he, he gave up 
because it's really easy to imagine bread as a consumption good. You know, we all eat bread. Can you imagine bread as a production good? How do you make, how do you use stale bread to make anything, including fresh bread? You simply can't. It's a logical conundrum. So a little brainwave that occurred to me, and this is one of the chances, one of the advantages of being a bit of a, a sci-fi junkie, uh, was I knew about this movie called The Iron Giant. And um, in this, it's obviously an animated cartoon. And the idea was, well, let's imagine, let's, rather than having a realistic consumption good, it makes it really hard to think of an investment good that works. Let's go the other way and make a, a, a fantastical consumption good. So the iron giant eats iron, but that means we can have a realistic investment model. So that's the trade-off I made at this particular point. So we have energy being used to mine energy, energy being used to mine iron ore, and energy being used to smelt iron ore and turn it into from iron into iron ore into iron, iron plus slag. So the waste turns up there. And then you can mold the iron ore into something the iron giants can consume, or you can make three types of machinery out of it. Energy mining machinery, iron ore mining machinery, and iron smelting and rolling machinery. So this is the, the realistic foundations. So energy is used by all three sectors. And these is, this is some of the logic behind it. This paper is published, by the way, on my, um, on my blog, my website, and I'll, I'll make it available through, um, I'll send an email off to the Oxford students uh, when I finish giving this presentation. So we then had the new factor that it turns up here was a conversion factor for convert, converting uh, your yield from your input. Now here, of course, in the case of energy, the yield from energy is energy, but in matter, the yield from ma energy is matter, and in production, again, the yield is matter and waste. Um, and we're using the conservation of energy and the conservation of matter as part of our logic to derive these models. So again, in that sense, this is a biophysically grounded approach to economics. Now, having done all that, uh, what I ended up finding was that I, because one of the big dilemmas in neoclassical economics is how do you measure capital? And if you haven't read about the capital controversies, get Jeff Harcourt's book and go and read up it and see how you had the wool pulled over your eyes for the last 40 years. But as it happens in trying to aggregate capital here, I found I, my aggregation was to add them up in terms of tons of iron. There's the number of machines times the weight of the machine. And that gave me a way of aggregating. It's, it's crude, but it's at least it's realistically based to begin with. Uh, and then I made a similar assumption for uh, the re relationship between the, the matter output of the mining sector and the matter input to the energy, to the uh, factory sector. And out of that, we could determine the yields. We're gonna make this more flexible in time, but this is all uh, to get a very first, uh, very first calculation. Again, I know I'm going faster even than your Oxford lectures go here. So I'm sorry about the speed I'm going up, but again, 45 minutes is a fairly tight constraint. But having done all that again, what do I get? But the Goodwin model, now including matter as part of the output. And when I put this all together, I get a model where there's waste not just waste energy, which wouldn't be as much of a problem because waste energy would be radiated into outer space. It's waste matter. That's the real problem we have in capitalism today. And that's just showing again, we can bring all these elements together and do economics still. <coughs> so I find it incredibly frustrating that I'm doing this in 2021 because we should have started straightening economics out in 1921, which is roughly when the peron Frobenius theorem came along and showed that Valois was wrong about atonement. Now, why don't we get progress? Well, Max Planck, who developed quantum mechanics, tried to persuade his colleagues at the time that this was the right solution to the black bloody radiation problem. But they found they, they couldn't get their heads around the idea of energy coming in small units. They were wedded to the Maxwellian vision of energy as a uniform wave. And they stuck with it. But it, what Max said is, well, they'll eventually die and somebody else and the students will take over who are open to a new way of thinking about the real world. So physics, physicists can't be converted to a new vision which destroys their paradigm. Uh, it just isn't, it's intellectually, emotionally beyond most of them. Uh, and Max said, I've got to rely upon the young students to do it. So let's look at how that happens in a genuine science. We'll go back and look at the Ptolemaic version of astronomy where the earth was supposed to be the center of the universe. And even though it's fundamentally wrong, 
it enabled them to predict where the planets would be 10, 50, 100 years in the future. But the anomalies continue to accumulate. And the simplest example I can give of, of how the real world and a prediction from a new paradigm undermined this one was the Aristotelian and Ptolemaic view of the universe was that the heavens are perfect, whereas the earth is where decay happens. Because we see the, earth, the heavens just rotate and never change, whereas on the earth we see things age and die and so on. So heavens are perfect, earth is where decay happens. And a little thing that occurred to me was, well, how do they explain comets? And when you look back in sort of literature, you find they actually thought comets were atmospheric phenomena okay? because they were unpredictable, obviously a sign of decay, let alone a meteor crashing into your local suburb. Um, so the explanation was it was atmospheric and they can't be predicted. Well, along come Halley's Comet. And it wasn't Halley's Comet that brought the Ptolemaic theory under, under uh, into disrepute. It was already started to fade in scientific circles well and truly by the time Halley's prediction came true. But the fact that Halley could predict it was he said, yes, we know that the Copernican vision is correct. So that's the sort of disconfirming element of a, of a new discovery coming from a new paradigm, which happens in a real science and gets rid of the previous paradigm. But it didn't convince Ptolemaic astronomers to abandon it. The ones that were still believed in Ptolemy would have found some other excuse for why the comet came back on time. So the genuine scientists undergo scientific revolutions. And I highly recommend reading Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, a brilliant book, one of the deepest books I've ever read. Uh, and if you, again, if you look at what pre-relativity uh, science was about to explain how light travels from the sun to the earth, you had to presume the existence of a medium through which the waves would propagate, which they called the ether. And that therefore mean that the earth going in one direction or the other around the sun, there'd be different speeds of light because of different directions through the ether. But they found there was no effect, no change at all. So what had happened? Well, the pre-relativity scientists, the ones um, um, Planck was talking about, just couldn't accept the problem. They continued teaching the old paradigm. They tried to find ways to modify it. The students sat through the lectures, took notes, but was thinking, I'm going to get one of the Nobel Prize if I can actually solve this problem. Uh, so the students, even though they're still being taught by the oldies, weren't believing the oldies. And then when a new theory came along, the students would accept it. Ultimately, the old students would have to retire or die. And when they did, they were replaced by new, new uh, scientists who were committed to a new paradigm. That's the process of renewal that a genuine science goes through, which is why this one liner uh, that summarizes Planck's views came around science advances one funeral at a time. Uh, and it's a punctuated progress. You have an established paradigm, a fundamental anomaly, established students, a scientist resisted. The students can't be persuaded to ignore the anomaly. A new paradigm comes along. The old scientists die. The students take their place and you get a change in paradigm. That's a genuine science. In economics, we get anomalies all the time, but they're ignored. First of all, you can never repeat the Great Depression. You can never repeat the Great Recession. It happened once and it's never repeated. And ultimately it's forgotten by people who come along later. Uh, a new event comes along like COVID and overwhelms it. Uh, they gloss over theoretical critiques, so like the capital controversies. And you'll actually find Paul Samuelson confeded defeat in 1966 in a paper called The Summing Up. I highly recommend reading that paper, probably the most honest thing Samuelson ever did. And there's a wonderful punchline at the end. If all this causes headaches for those nostalgic for the old time parables of neoclassical writing, we must remind ourselves that scholars are not born to live in easy existence. We must respect and appraise the facts of life. And he'd lived up to that, I wouldn't be giving this lecture. So neoclassicals still teach this marginal productivity garbage, which has been disproved by something that was written uh, well, certainly before most of you were even thought about, let alone born. Uh, so, and also the existing adherents want to ignore the paradigm. They do want to forget it. They don't want to be reminded about the great recession and so on. Uh, now, there are some students who refuse to forget. So that's where Hyman Minsky came along and asked a different question. And that's where we get different schools of thought in economics. So Kaminsky asked himself the question, what caused the Great Depression? Can it happen again? And if it can happen, why didn't it happen before the time he was writing back in the mid-1980s? Mid so he said, we have to have a theory which can generate 
the Great Depression, which of course neoclassical economics can't do. So what we get therefore is some people like myself become followers of a rebel like Minsky, you get a rival paradigm, we're marginalized, we're ignored, uh, and the, the, we never end up replacing neoclassical economics, we're just complaining from the outside about it. And economics effectively remains pre-scientific. It doesn't have the revolution that desperately needs to be refined. And the old paradigm can find believers in the new theory. I'm sure some of the people watching this lecture are most likely going to be some of the new believers because the vision it has is a wonderful utopian anarchist interpretation of capitalism. Neoclassicals are fundamentally utopian anarchists. They believe in a meritocratic world in harmony without central control. Well, good stuff. Uh, you know, please go and join Extinction Rebellion. Uh, you find yourself some odd bedfellows, but frankly, the mindset you've got is an anarchist mindset about capitalism. And the students get sucked in by it. It's a wonderful mechanical system. They become the new professors. People like me end up either normally leaving economics. I became a bit of a, a pain in the ass and came back in in my mid thirties. The old paradigm carries on. You ignore the anomalies and we're back where we started again with critics taking it on. And critics like myself end up in poorly funded universities like University of Western Sydney or Kingston, or you work in business and marketing. Uh, or maybe in finance sector think tanks and stuff like that. So economics avoids its revolution and is not a science for that reason. To be a science, you have to undergo revolutions. Economics hasn't undergone one since 1870. Uh, and they make absurd assumptions to get over anomalies in the, in the process. The number of absurd assumptions is frankly absurd. Uh, there's a great joke there about assuming a can open. I'm happy to repeat that one. Um, so please, what I'm, I'm going to plead with you, because I know from talking to students at Oxford and talking to some students who are going to be replacing their professors at some time in the future, don't keep the old paradigm undead. Take the risk and help develop a new one. Learn complex systems analysis, learn system dynamics. Uh, the downside is you're going to, have to do much more work to teach yourself outside what you're taught in your own lectures. Uh, you probably won't get a lectures at Oxford anyway, they'll, they'll block you. Um, I managed to get in through the back door, which is another story I'm happy to uh, go into uh, in questions if anybody's interested. But the upside is you'll be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. You can get an interesting job outside economic system dynamics is now becoming more and more widely used in industry. And it's a challenging and interesting approach to thinking. And the main one I'm going to come down here and, and finish on is that you'll avoid the blame when climate change exposes neoclassical economics for the farce that it is. You may know that I've written a recent uh, uh, analysis of Nordhaus's work, uh, and I've never seen anything as bad as Nordhaus's work on climate change, except for that done by his friend, Richard Toll. Uh, so for example, one of the reasons that climate change is gonna have a trivial impact upon the economy is because not us assumed it would have a trivial impact upon the economy. He literally assumed that 87% of industry would be unaffected by climate change. Just an assumption, because it happens indoors. That's really about as deep as I could find it. And here's Richard Toll in a recent tweet, 10K, 10 degrees Celsius. It's less than the temperature distance between Alaska and, and Maryland. Climate is not a primary driver of income. That is a climate change denialist masquerading as an economist. So we're going to have, a, at some point when the real world throws this nonsense out the window, uh, where people are going to be saying, who led us up this garden path? And the answer will be neoclassical economists. I think it'd be very wise not to be one of them. I'll just actually quickly finish here by showing a list of references I've got for this paper. I'm sure most of you can access them. The ones I've put in bold are the ones I'd highly recommend reading. Uh, so you get away from thinking like a neoclassical economist. And I shall leave it at that and hand back to Oliver hoping I've managed to hit 45 minutes. Okay. Great. It was an hour, but that's that's fine. There was a, <laughs> there was a, lot, there was a lot of material. You went True. into great, great depth. It was very, very interesting. Um, so I, I'll, I'll ask three questions so that we don't go too much over time. Um, yeah. My first question was, um, where has post-Keynesian economics or heterodox thinking gained the most traction? Um, is it in central banks, the, the asset management industry, economic departments in the global south, um, or are there certain universities in Europe, for example, which are, have, um, have developed this? 
That's a very good question. Um, I think your answers, you, you actually answered it pretty well as well. Those are the places where it has got some traction. So like the Bank of England, um, I, I knew that the Bank of England was going to come out with a damn good paper in 2014 uh, because I'd spoken to some of the staff in 2010 and I knew there were people doing stock flow consistent modelling inside the Bank of England. And Andy Haldane also appointed a large number of people from outside mainstream economics for the one bank method. So uh, I was delighted when the Bank of England came up with that paper in 2014, but I was aware they were doing the background research to do it. So uh, central banks, some treasuries, mainly uh, low ranked universities like uh, Paris Sud, uh, Paris North 13, uh, Kingston, which has had its program destroyed largely by the uh, a change in government funding uh, under the Tories, unfortunately. Uh, Leeds, uh, Bristol, there is a handful of non-mainstream, you know, second-rate universities overall with first-rate economists because that's where the post-Keynesians can get a job and have some dominant impact upon the profession. And then the Global South, I've just done a seminar last week with uh, a large number of academics in uh, Islamic universities in Malaysia. Mm. So, so there are there are glimpses, but it's a very very tough world, unfortunately. And then, of course, in the finance sector. Right. Um, so then, in that case, well, I feel like you've already answered this. I'll step that question then. Um, and for those who are interested in learning more about uh, post Keynesian macroeconomics, uh, what next steps would you suggest they take? Um, Re-debunking economics, and that's you know, pushing my own arrow, but that's that's a good start to understand the critiques of the mainstream. Uh, then Mark Lavoie's work, I would actually recommend Mark Lavoie's books as probably the best, most accessible and, and, and deepest of the post-Keynesians. And then for a simple read, but one that's very important, uh, read Stephanie Kelton's The Deficit Myth. That'll give you the foundations of modern monetary theory. Uh, I actually very much enjoy reading, a, it's now a very old book, but... Um, I was thinking of the name of, uh, um, uh, I've got Janos Kornai in my mind, but it's not Kornai, damn. Uh, Kragel, Jan Kragel, uh, post Keynesian economics. It's a bit dated these days, post Keynesian economics, a reconstruction of political economy, but a very good book to show an alternative approach. Um, so, but definitely I'd, I'd go for Mark's book and mine together as the best foundations. Okay, and final question. Um, why do you think there is such strong resistance to heterodox economic thinking in the mainstream? Um, you mentioned how in, how come other sciences have been able to have this revolution and economics um, hasn't been able to do this? Well, again, it comes back to the fact that there's, neoclassical economics is very seductive. It gives you a, a, a perfectly functioning machine which has the outcome that everybody receives what they deserve and you don't need any central coordination. It is basically a vision of an anarchist society. No, and anarchy means no government. And in, in fact, when you look at what they're, do, they're doing, their attitude, the government is actually trying to eliminate it most of the time. So they, they, and they don't realise it, but they're, they're, they're zealots. And they're being revolutionaries for a, a system they think will abolish power. Now, in fact, what that ends up doing is the exact opposite. It means to entrench power because it tells you don't look at the finance sector. Well, where's the power in capitalism? It's in the finance sector. Uh, it says don't let workers uh, cooperate. And what happens? Workers get their unions destroyed and their wages get crushed by fighting against organised uh, employers. So we've had this wage freeze coming out of it as well. The end result is by telling, telling us don't look at those particular elements of the real world, they end up making those elements of the real world even worse than they would be without their intervention. So uh, their, 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 their objectives, their motivations are good because they're believing a false theory. Their outcome is disastrously bad. Great. That's all we have time for. Um, if you'd like to rewatch Professor Keane's talk, it'll be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, our next event will be Tuesday next week with um, Ryan Kaplan titled um, Poverty, Who to Blame? A Libertarian Approach. Um, and we'll also, we're also hosting Randall Ray um, who's a strong proponent of uh, MMT uh, later this term. So tune in for that. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Professor Keane. You're welcome.